So, Gareth, first of all, if you just tell me, how did you become involved in the series Children of the Stones? I was I was had a fairly long period out of work, and as, long, as far as I remember, my agent suddenly phoned up and said, "This is not a, uh, an interview; it's a request. Would you like to do a children's series?" And I said, "Well, uh, that'll depend on script." And so they sent the script, and I read them, and I thought, "This is actually a cracking good story." And uh, so basically, I said, "Yes, I'd love to do it," and did it. What was your reluctance based on uh, this, at that particular point in your career? Did you think that doing a children's series might kind of devalue you? What was your reasons for your hesitancy? I'd not long finished a thing called Parky, uh, not Parky's Patch, uh, Sutherland's Law, which was a series in Scotland about a procurator fiscal. Um, I'd done some major one-off plays before that, and I wasn't sure about whether a children's series would actually sort of put me into a different bracket or not. But then having looked at the script and having thought to myself, actually it's another branch, as opposed to anything else, it's another bit of audience who may well be with me for a very, very long time if I'm lucky. So yes, I'll do it. But the main thing actually was just a cracking good script. Mm. Part of the reason why I fell for the script was was the fact that it did touch on so many different things. Um, I mean, where were we talking about? 25 years ago, mid-70s. Uh, the hippies had just sort of basically disappeared. But there was an element of that sort of relaxation. There was an element of uh, pure science. There was a, a considerable amount of informative science, actually. Um, there was an element of mysticism. Uh, there was an element of the... Oh, I don't know how you put it, really. The old folklore, ley lines, etc. Uh, the stones themselves... I mean, even now, 25 years later, we still don't know what Silver Hill's all about. Um, and so all those elements were, were, were very much of the time, for the time, and very well handled, I think, in the script. I thought, well, yes, this is actually more than a children's script. It's more, I, I hate the word, but it's, it's a word which has been used recently, more a kidult script as opposed to youngsters. Um, and I just thought it was exciting. I mean, I, I, and I thought it was, a, a, it certainly grabbed me, and I thought if it grabs me, it's going to grab an awful lot of people. Yeah. So that was the main thing. When I read the script, I, I, obviously I knew that it was Adam I was going to play. Um, and I, I thought to myself, well, it's one of those things, really, I ought to walk on the screen with plot written across my forehead. Because basically every time I open my mouth, I'm saying plot, plot, plot. Um, and an awful lot of it was. That in itself, though, was a, was a considerable challenge, to make that interesting uh, and also to get the plot across without being boring um, and letting people actually believe it and become part of it. There were parts, actually, which, which um, were not plot, were, were much more... Uh, I mean, the, the relationship between uh, the young boy and the young girl, the father and the young boy, and the father and the young girl's mother, that quadruple relationship, square relationship, was most interesting to play, because, of course, being a children's series, nothing ever actually happened either way, anywhere, or anything like that. But because you were actually not playing to very young children, there was an element of, an element of, uh, of reality in those relationships, which again is a challenge, uh, to, to be able to put that across without making it A, too obvious, B, suggestive, or C, just a little bit smutty. You know, I mean, to actually get that across as serious and genuine and, and acceptable. So there were all those little challenges in it, which made it great fun. Watching it the other day, uh, I was actually rather pleased that 25 years ago I felt there's some lines which were a little bit stilted now or if not stilted now some lines were very plot descriptive um, you know plot 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 which I must admit I was quite pleased that I see I think I'd got away with as being quite natural uh, that did surprise me because I must admit I, I don't think I've ever thought of myself as anything other than that. well not average but I mean you, you, you can have no opinion about yourself as an actor. I don't think I was good. There are an awful lot of things I would like to do better. Um, but there were one or two occasions I thought, oh, actually, I believe me doing that. <laughs> or shall we say, I think that's the way I do it now. That's probably more accurate, actually. I think, yes, I wouldn't have changed that. I mean, it's very difficult to look at yourself 25 years ago with all the experience of 25 years hindsight and say, I wouldn't change anything. Uh, there's an enormous amount I would change. Uh, in, in, in playing it now, but then it probably would be wrong now, because of course I, I'm not as I'm not as young as I was then, if you see what I mean. 
Uh, it would be an old man in a young young man's body. Uh, <laughs> but, I, you know, it wasn't too bad. I was surprised when I found out that Freddie and Freddie Jones and Ian Cuthbertson were doing it because I knew both of them. Freddie, actually, um, had had a, a stunning success with a series called Claudius. No, not Claudius. See the Caesars for Granada, I believe, uh, before I Claudius. Uh, and he'd been sort of very well known for that. Ian had done an enormous amount of work in um, Scotland, particularly. Um, the play Armstrong's Last Good Night was actually written for Ian Cuthbertson, uh, only they didn't know him down here, so I think it was Albert Finney played it when he came down to London, but it was actually written for Ian Cuthbertson. So he was well known in Scotland. Um, I don't think he'd done Budgie by then. I don't think so. Um, but we'd done a series called Sutherland's Law together in Scotland, which was networked. So he was quite well known as well. And I do remember talking to Freddie and Ian uh, over dinner one night, I think, and we all agreed that the thing really which had made us do it was this very, very good, exciting, unusual, which is the word I hadn't used before, actually, but unusual script. Um, and so that was why we all agreed to do it, or wanted to do it, it totally independently of each other, of course. Um, it helped when we found out that we all knew each other. <laughs> Producer director Peter Graham Scott I'd never met, but he was sort of a legend in his... Well, he still is alive. He was a legend even then. Um, I'm not quite sure why. Uh, I met him when we were sort of when we started doing it, and I must admit I got on terribly well with him. Got a lovely sense of humour. I can tend to be a little bit wicked sometimes. Um, not not nasty, but I mean I can be a bit cheeky and. Well, I, I'm one of those that if you can't laugh, don't join the ball game. Um, and if I'm going to do a job like acting, which I find exhausting quite seriously and emotionally draining, then I'm going to have some fun doing it. And Peter's very much of the same ilk. Um, which is probably why neither of us are working much at the moment, uh, because it's all got terribly, terribly serious and accountancy controlled now. <laughs> I mean, accountants rule the world now. But anyway, um, no, Peter was great fun, um, always very relaxed. I don't think we had, I can't remember ever having any quibbles or rows of any kind, I mean, amongst the crew or anybody. It was all very relaxed and very easygoing. Um, and, and great fun. No, I, I, I enjoyed working with them enormously. I'm very sad I didn't work with them again. Um, but there you go, it's one of those things. Can you remember, I mean, were there kind of gags or stuff on, on set? Are there any memories of, of the production itself? That was... I've got various memories during the recordings of laughing at various occasions, but I can't remember why. I was watching it again with my wife the other night, and there was a moment when I, I, when I can't remember the lady's name, I gave me breakfast, and young Adam was about to have breakfast too. It's just after he'd been knocked on the head the day after. And I remember when we recorded that in the studio that I started laughing because every time I went to eat, I, I, and then I said something else, and then, and then, I, and then I said something else. And I, I'm never going to get this, it'll be cold by the time I get there. And eventually I think I did take a mouthful. But I do remember roaring with laughter in the studio. He said, do I ever get to eat this stuff? <laughs> but I don't remember many other things. I'm, I'm sure there were lots of occasions. I mean, I know there would have been because working with Freddie and Ian, I remember on Southern's Law we had lots of laughs with Ian and myself. So I'm sure we did down here. Can you talk a little bit about the location filming at, at Avebury and hmm. what that was like and whether, you know, whether the, the atmosphere of Avebury kind of rubbed off on you or, or the, the cast? When we, I mean, we, we were based in Bristol as, as the sort of the studios and 90% of the filming was done out at Avebury and a lot of it inside the Stone Circle. I think I'm right in saying that the village of Avebury was actually built inside the Stone Circle but the church is built outside it. Um, when we filmed there, it was a long, hot summer, uh, and various things happened, not to me, but various things happened. One, I remember um, three or four of the crew, their watches went completely haywire inside the circle. No apparent reason, just went haywire. Um, there was a shot where uh, um, Freddie Jones, as, as Dai, the sort of tramp or whatever, uh, snared a rabbit, and the young lad let it free. I think if I remember right, it became very funny. Oh, cut! Let's have another rabbit! <laughs> we went to about seven or eight rabbits on that one. Because they just did run, and of course we just left in the body, you couldn't catch them again. But I think the, one I, the thing I remember most about filming Inside the Circle was purely for dramatic and televisual terms, we had to put up one or two polystyrene scenes to make the circle look a little bit more complete. And they looked absolutely wonderful. And we were sitting there inside the circle having lunch one day, leaning against one of these big proper stones, and some American tourists came round. And this elderly lady was walking around looking and saying, wow, look, this is a me Hiram, look at this. And she pushed one of the stones, and it was a polystyrene one, and fell over. 
and she went into hysteria. She thought this goddamn thing's been here for 4,000 years and I pushed it over. And we just lay there crying with laughter because she, she was quite convinced that she'd actually pushed a 4,000 year old stone over. <laughs> and the only other thing I remember was we used the village shop as a post office. And uh, so, of course, fine. At the end of the day, the props guys came along to remove the post box and found a pile of postcards on the pavement. <laughs> Tourists had genuinely believed it was a post office. To be fair, they, they did actually post them. <laughs> but it, I mean, no, it was great fun. I mean, first of all, it's a lovely location. Uh, secondly, there is an atmosphere, not spooky, but you are very much aware of the fact that you're sitting in the middle of something that was 4,000 years old and we still don't really know why and how. Plus the fact that any sort of location like that in a long, hot summer is glorious. Had it been pouring with rain, I think one's memories might have been quite different. <laughs> were the locals involved, I mean, as extras and as the villagers, or were they all...? No, there were some locals involved as extras, yes. Or as, oh, no, no, they're not allowed to call them no, non-speaking artists or something politically correct. Extras. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, there were some local people involved, yes. Um, I mean, anybody who had anything to say, yes, of course, in those days, you had to belong to the union. And so that was all professional actors. Did you meet with the, uh, the scriptwriters, Jeremy Burnham and Trevor Ray? Were they on, on set at all? The lady playing the sort of the female interest, which was the adult female interest, um, was married to one of the scriptwriters, Jeremy Burnham. Uh, and Trevor Ray was the other one. And so partly because of that, but also I think generally because they were actually very much involved in the whole thing, they were down there in, in Bristol quite a lot. Uh, in fact, most recording days they came down. As far as I remember, we actually changed very little. Um, so they must have done a fair amount of work before we got down there. I mean, normally when you're doing a series or whatever, you change bits and pieces along the way. As far as I can remember, we changed very, very little indeed. Um, and they were there quite a lot of the time. Was there any kind of concern on your part, or indeed anybody else's, that um, the script, precisely because it was intelligent, sort of detailed, and drew on you know, various sets of ideas, that it actually might be beyond the reach of some of the viewers? I don't think so. Um, no more beyond the reach of any viewers in the sense that if you're going to do anything which deals, A, with science... Uh, be with astronomy or astrology, either of them, you're going to have some viewers who don't fully understand it, but they're going to understand what you're talking about, basically. And I think it's the, it wasn't so much the scientific language which was confusing, which it was, um, but it was fairly obvious what was happening. And that, I think, meant that it was, it was acceptable to all and, and understandable by all. As far as the end was concerned, I, mean, I, I think, basically, it's, it's Shakespeare and tie up the loose ends. How do I get out of this one? Um, <laughs> To, to, to call in an alternative time plane is an old trick. I mean, um, uh, J.B. Priestley does it, J.M. Barry does it all the time. Um, and, I mean, if, if you hadn't done that, it, it wouldn't have had a proper ending. I mean, I suppose you could possibly say that it was the forerunner of Star Trek, you know, beam me up, Scotty, or beam me up, Cuthbertson. Uh, <laughs> but, I mean, I, I seriously don't think they would have had any other way out of it. I mean, it would have come to a a deeply unsatisfactory and this way at least was relatively enigmatic which kept the interest right up to the end I think. Yeah. How successful was the series? I gather it was very successful at the time. One thing that has surprised me and always does surprise me uh, is that it's never been shown again. Uh, I did a series after that called Blake Seven uh, which was also very popular. It was pure science fiction. Uh, I wouldn't say that Children of the Stones are science fiction, but somebody who's interested in science fiction may well have watched Children of the Stones. And I've been amazed by the number of people who are fans of Blake Seven who keep on coming back to Children of the Stones and saying, oh, well, you remember when you did Children of the Stones? Because they've all seen it. Uh, and that puts the figure at somewhere, I don't know, sort of eight or nine million. Um, and so I'm very surprised it's never been re-shown. Because I, I remember at the time people saying, that's a cracking good series, and oh, isn't it a good story, and... I seem to remember some people saying the acting's not bad either. Uh, <laughs> um, but it was, it was very successful at the time. But it, as I say, it's never been repeated. And I would have thought that it's a perfect one to repeat. Because having watched it recently, um, which incidentally is the only thing that I've ever watched that I've done on television um, and been suitably embarrassed by it. But uh, apart from my bouffant hairstyle and being a lot slimmer and all of us looking an awful lot younger and some very strange clothes I was wearing, strange colours I wouldn't dare wear now. 
But apart from that, it actually still holds up very, very well. I mean, both the story um, and even, I mean, Avery hasn't changed. I was down there about six months ago and it's still exactly the same as it was then. A few more tourists. But I mean, um, I'm very surprised. It was very popular. And I think would be again. I can waffle for Wales, by the way. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> the Commonwealth Games, I waffle for Wales. <laughs> <laughs>